think maybe what we'll do is start off with a poll regarding shorting. And I thought it would be good just to have a, a general sense of what everyone's experience is or what the overall overwhelming experience is in the room. Um, and so I see that uh, about half of you that have responded have said you've never shorted a stock, which isn't too surprising. I always think that they're going to be fewer and fewer folks that haven't shorted, meaning I, you know, that most have. But every time I've done a webinar, uh, I find this somewhat to be true that the, the majority or at least half uh, have not shorted before. You can see 28 percent. So almost 80 percent, roughly 80 percent of you have either never shorted a stock or you only do it occasionally. Uh, another 10 percent um, only short in a bear market. Um, and I, that's where I would probably be. I can't remember the last time I shorted a stock um, in a bull market. It's been a long time since I've shorted a stock. Uh, but I tend to only short stocks in a bear market. And I don't trade in a bear market on the short side the way I do in a bull market on the long side. I mean, when I'm when I'm really bullish, I'm 100% invested on the long side. Um, and I'm quickly uh, uh, kind of running through my portfolio, turning it over uh, because I do trade pretty often. Um, and then finally, at the end there, you can see I short stocks frequently, 8% of you. So it is a, a minority. But I get questions all the time, you know, what is shorting, you know, how does it work and so forth. So I thought what we would do is uh, let me start off the presentation just by giving you a quick analogy that maybe uh, might make it a little clearer. Maybe I'll just muddy the waters more. I don't know. Um, but let me uh, give you an analogy real quick. So let's say that uh, you're home and your next door neighbor has your let's say you're a car person. You're really into cars. And you see that the next door neighbor has a car. They haven't been using it, just been sitting in their driveway. And you know something about this particular car and the fact that it's going to lose value over the next 30 days. Now, you want to try to profit from that. So you go over like you're the, the nice neighborly person that you are and ask if you can borrow their car uh, for about 30 days. Uh, now, let's, see, let's forget about the fact you'd need their title and all. Let's not get too... Uh, too specific. But let's just say you are able to take their car, borrow it from them for a month. You're going to return it to them. But you want to profit from the value of this car dropping over the next 30 days. So you borrow their car and you take it and you know that right now is the best value that you're going to get. So you want to sell it now and you want to buy it back later after the value has gone down. So let's say this car is worth 20000 today and you think in 30 days it's going to be worth 15000 so you take your borrow their car, tell them 30 days, you'll return it, and then you sell it to someone. You borrow your neighbor's car and you sell it to a third party for $20,000. One month later, that car, just like you thought, drops down to a $15,000 value, and you go back and you buy the car back for $15,000 in 30 days, and you take it back to your neighbor and say, here's your car back. Essentially, what you've done, you never owned the stock. It wasn't yours. You were borrowing a neighbor's car. You went out, you sold it, you made $5,000, bought it back, $5,000 cheaper. So you've pocketed the difference and now you've turned it back over to your neighbor. Your neighbor doesn't know any different, right? I mean, you just borrowed their car. They didn't know what you did with it. And then you returned it, hopefully in the same condition. Um, that's essentially what you're doing with shorting stocks. Um, you know, there's so many stocks, it's a little easier just thinking about one car. And that's why I wanted to use the analogy. But think about all the shares of stock that people own in all the different brokerages around the, the world. Um, essentially, what you're doing when you're shorting is you're borrowing someone else's shares and you're selling them to try to profit from a decline in price. You're going to get your target, you're going to sell, you're going to make your money, and then you're going to turn your shares back over to the person that you borrowed them from. Now, the brokerages take care of all this for you. So it's not that, uh, that, not that big a deal. All right. Um, now I'm going to go into the key terms and risks. After that, uh, we'll talk about considering the odds. Uh, you know I'm a historian. Um, run some scans that I would set up in a bear market. Uh, and then talk about reward to risk setups from a shorting perspective. So that's kind of the layout that we're going to go through and talk about today. So let me go through some of the, the terms and risks. And I think maybe what I'll do first is just pull up a chart of, I don't know, maybe say Apple. And uh, at least give you something to look at while we're while I'm discussing a few concepts. 
So when you short, um, you know, shorting or short selling, that's when an investor borrows shares, immediately sells them, and then hopes that he or she can buy them back later at a lower price. After all of that takes place, then you take the shares, you return them to the lender, and essentially you're pocketing the difference in price. You're, you're, making, a mo you're making money when that particular stock that you shorted goes lower. So you borrow someone's shares, you sell it, the price drops, you buy it back at a lower price, and then you return those shares. That's how, in theory, it's supposed to work. Now, there are a lot of risks, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but before we do, i just give you an, uh, one or two more terms. When you uh, buy back your shares, sometimes you'll hear someone say that uh, you know, you're covering your short or that you're covering. Essentially, what you're doing is you're buying back that short position. That's what covering means. Um, now, the investment risk of being long, not short, but long, your investment risk is whatever you invest. So if you say, I want to get into Apple and I want to buy 100 shares at $185 or $186, my risk is $18,500, roughly, maybe $18,600. That if the worst case scenario happens and I don't know, something Apple computers start blowing up and, you know, start taking out countries and all of a sudden Apple stock goes to zero, the most money you can lose is eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. One of the problems with shorting, let's say you look at Apple and you say, well, it's just it's moved up way too, too much, too fast. Uh, I, I want to short the stock. I think it's going to pull back fifteen dollars. And when it does, I want to make that $15. Well, what you would do is you would short Apple. So you would sell short with your broker. And so the broker would borrow someone else's shares and allow you to sell them. And then if Apple pulls back $15, then you would buy them back and you would essentially be returning those shares back to the broker. And you would then make money. You would sell at $185 and you'd sell it or you'd buy it back at $170. So instead of buying at 170 first and selling at 185, you're just doing it in reverse. You're selling at 185 and then you're buying back at 170. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, that's perfect if it works out well. But what happens if Apple, uh, you know, they just came out recently or Warren Buffett just came out and announced that uh, Berkshire Hathaway has bought 75 million shares. What, ha what would happen if that announcement came out right after you shorted and Apple you know, takes off $20. I mean, here's, we've had a huge move up with earnings and with that announcement. Um, but uh, Buffett's been talking about buying Apple for some time that he was getting into Apple. But anyway, the point here is that if you get in, if you short at 185 or, you know, 185, so now you're short, um, you know, you've essentially sold the stock for $18,500 if you short 100 shares. The question is, how much risk are you taking on this? Because now all of a sudden, your risk is to the upside, not to the downside. How high could Apple go? Well, you might say, well, you know, it's $930 billion company. It can't go that much higher. Well, not too long ago, it was two, three, four hundred billion dollar company and it got up to $930 billion. Who's to say it's not going to be a $1.5 trillion company in a year or two or five years? So are you going to short and hold on to this thing long term? Is it going to be a trade? The thing you have to realize with shorting is that your risk, your unlimited risk, is to the upside. So when you buy a stock, you know what your downside risk is. It's how much you invest. Your upside is unlimited. With shorting, it's the other way around. With shorting, the most you can make is 18500 But if the stock goes against you and you think you're just going to hold on to this stock for a long time, you know, and wait until it collapses because you just know Apple is going to be a bad investment. That can get really painful over time. Take a look at a 20, actually a 15 year monthly chart on Apple. Pull this up. Now, what would have happened 15 years ago if you decided, you know what, Apple, I, I just don't get the, the hype on this company. I'm going to short it at a dollar or the equivalent of a dollar. Obviously, it didn't trade for a dollar back then. It, this is split adjusted. But let's just say, that it traded for a dollar and you decided you wanted to short it. Well, if you had to cover today for every dollar that you um, shorted, you'd have to cover $185. And you think, well, you know, that's not really possible. 
there was a story recently a company came out it was or a, an individual came out and uh shorted 37,000 I didn't even pull up the uh, ticker symbol but shorted $37,000 worth of a stock KBIO I don't know if that's uh let's see what we have here no it's not going to come up well I think it got bought out I think what happened is stock got bought out that's why it's not showing here but literally someone invested they shorted they didn't invest but they shorted $37,000 worth of KBIO stock the next day Another pharma, that CEO gained control of KBIO shares and the stock, KBIO stock went up 800% the next day. Now, you can do the math if you'd like, but $37,000 and all of a sudden, if you make 800%, you're going to be pretty darn happy. But when you get caught in a squeeze like that, the investor said he got caught. The broker couldn't get him out of the shares because this thing just, just shot up ended up wiping out his and his wife's entire 401k in order to cover. And I mean, this I thought was kind of bold, but he, he started a GoFundMe page. And you can imagine what other investors thought of that. Uh, didn't get a whole lot of contribution. Let me just say that fundraiser didn't work out very well for him. Um, but that is a risk. When you're getting in on the short side, you have to understand your risk to the upside, or in this case, the downside, is unlimited as a short you know, when you're shorting. It's unlimited to the upside when you're long. It's unlimited to the downside when you're shorting. A couple other things you might not realize about shorting. If you short a stock that pays a dividend, you're paying the dividend. A lot of people don't realize that. So if a stock that you are shorting has a 5% dividend and you go through that whole ex-dividend uh, process, you got to pay that dividend. So it's not just you know, when you own a stock, you get the return on the stock, and then you also get to accumulate the dividends. If you're on the short side, you're on the other side. Keep that in mind. A couple of other terms. Uh, short squeeze. What's a short squeeze? Well, short squeeze is when a stock's price jumps. Let's say, I'm trying to look for something. Actually, let's go to a daily chart on Apple here. So you can see the gap up here. When you get a lot of volume coming in and you can see, you know, Apple was kind of drifting lower. All of a sudden you get good news and you start seeing breakouts and so forth. This is a form of a short squeeze for those who are on the short side. That all of a sudden now you've got a lot more buyers and sellers. You've got a key breakout and many of the folks that have shorted, maybe thinking that we weren't going to go through the 20 day moving average, that we're going to drop back down all of a sudden now are seeing prices move against them. And so they sold way down here and now they're going to have to buy back at a much higher price. And you always say, you know, it's just the opposite of when you're long, you know, you're short prices moving up. It's like, okay, when it pulls back, I'm going to get out of this thing. Well, it just keeps going up and that forces a lot of shorts. It squeezes a lot of shorts and creates more demand for the stock as those shorts have to run to cover, run for cover and run for the exit basically and get out of that short position. So um, keep in mind that short positions do at some point create demand. You have to buy those shares back at some point. How about short interest? Short interest is the total number of shares of a particular stock that have been sold short by investors, but have not yet covered. Um, you can see it as a, it can be expressed as a number of shares or it can be expressed as a percentage of those shares relative to the outstanding shares. Uh, short interest ratio. This is where you take the number of shares sold on a stock and you divide it by the average daily volume. It's also referred to as days to cover. Many of you may, may be familiar with days to cover ratio. Um, the higher the ratio, obviously the more impact. If you start to get a breakout, the squeeze could be even triggered much more um, you know, much more from a, from a uh, breakout standpoint, you could have a lot more buyers coming in to fuel that rally. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, now, one of the things I ran into when I shorted, I had multiple uh, brokerage accounts. I would go into one account, like say Scott Trade, and I would try to short a stock and they'd say no shares available. And then you run into that quite a bit. Uh, and then I would go to Schwab or to TD Ameritrade or E-Trade or something like that, and I'd be able to short. 
So some brokers may not have the shares available while other brokers do. So if you're just trading at one broker, you could run into some difficulties there. It gets very frustrating when you find a great looking chart and you're like, wow, I just want to short this thing. You go to your broker and the, oh, we don't have any shares available. That's frustrating. Um, you also have to be careful with the small cap shares uh, that don't have as many. Uh, sometimes the, the, the short squeeze can be much worse on a company that doesn't have as much volume or as many shares outstanding. Uh, first of all, you might have problems finding shares to short. But then uh, if you do get into them, you got to be careful because sometimes the that short interest is higher on small cap shares where there's not as many shares outstanding. So you just got to be careful there. Now, what are some of the risks of shorting? Well, first of all, and this is probably the biggest one, the overall stock market can just go higher. We're in a bull market. One of the reasons why I won't short right now is because we're in a bull market. The bull market's continuing to go higher. I know we're consolidating right now, but I believe the market's going to go higher. So I'm not interested in shorting because if the market does go higher, the odds of me getting the right stock and being in the right position for a short, uh, those odds are just not as great as when you're in a bear market or when you're in a consolidation mode like we've been the last few months. How about company becomes takeover candidate? We've seen that before. Stock is under pressure for quite some time. Chart looks horrible. And then all of a sudden the company comes out and sees the value and says, well, we were looking to take over. You know, we're, gonna, we're bidding X dollars per share or whatever. So you can see a huge jump there company just announces good news. All of a sudden, big earnings surprise. Uh, maybe they just hired a CFO from another company uh, because they, you know, they, they fired their CEO. I've, we've seen this before where a company not doing well fires their CFO or CEO and the stock jumps. And, you know, it's a nice little parting present uh, to the, to the executive that's leading. It's like, thank you very much for your service and the stock appreciates you leaving. A uh, well-known investor announces a position in the stock. Take Warren Buffett, what he just came out and said, Berkshire Hathaway just bought 75 million shares of Apple. Market loved it, jumped up. So you could have something like that happen. Uh, there could just be a positive development in the industry, in a company's industry. Or how about legislative changes or political changes or geopolitical tensions that might uh, improve or uh, alter a company's prospects? Lots of different things can happen. And of course, if you're on the short side, you're subject to unlimited risk to the upside if the market cont continues taking off. All right, I uh, mentioned the odds. Uh, just consider for a minute that since 1950, the S&P 500 has moved up 53% of the trading days. So by simple math, it's gone down 47% of the time. On the NASDAQ since 1971, the NASDAQ has risen 55% of the trading days. It's gone down 45% of the days. So just from that perspective alone, the market goes up more than it goes down. That's a risk of being short. Okay, uh, let's keep moving on. Uh, I want to get into uh, a couple of, well, one scan in particular. So I'm going to go back to the main page here. Uh, and, and there's a lot I could talk about with shorting. I mean, I didn't get into margin requirements. Uh, there's a lot of different options. I mean, you know, just to short would be very risky, but there are option strategies that can lower the risk. It's like, you know, if you're on the long side, you have a covered call strategy uh, that, you know, a lot of folks think of options as being risky, but sometimes they actually do uh, lower your risk. And so there are option strategies uh, relating to shorting that can help. But, you know, we could get into that. We'd be talking for I'd be talking for a lot more than 30 minutes. Anyhow, let's move into uh, running scans. So I did set up a scan. Now, we're not in a bear market, but if we were in one and I was looking to short uh, I would be looking at this short scan that I set it up. Uh, so let's edit the scan. Now this is on. This is the basic workbench. Um, let's see. I could move it over to the advanced scan workbench. Uh, for those of you who are more familiar with this, you can kind of look to see how this is set up. But essentially, what I'm doing is I'm I've I'm looking only at the S&P 500 first of all. Um, I'm looking at the 20-day moving average, or actually the 20-day uh, moving average of volume being greater than 40,000. Well, that's not a problem if, with the S&P 500. They're all going to be greater than 40,000. The RSI is greater than 55, but it's less than 60. Now, think about a stock that's downtrending. When it's in a downtrend and the RSI gets back up close to 60, that tends to be a cap. Just like when a stock is uptrending, when it pulls back to 40, 
I've talked about that many times on the show. I like RSI 40 as support. Well, in the downtrend, I like RSI 60 as resistance. So this is giving me stocks that have RSIs between 55 and 60. And then finally, and this one's important, the 20 day moving average is below the 50 day moving average. So in an uptrending stock, the 20 should be above the 50. In a downtrending stock, a lot of times you'll see the 20 below the 50. So I've got the 20 day below the 50 day moving average and the RSI between 55 and 60. So in other words, it's a downtrending stock, but it's probably bounced. And this is a, a scan that I would run. So if I run this scan, uh, currently on the S&P 500, it brings back 22 stocks. So I thought what we would do is maybe look at some of these and consider how we would set up a reward to risk on the various stocks. Now, I don't know if we'll have time to go through all 22, but let's take a look at a few of them here. The first one is Autodesk. All right, now, if you're looking at Autodesk, first of all, you can see the 20 is just crossed below the 50, but it's starting to turn up and Autodesk, you know, m many stocks are gonna be in uptrends over the longer term, but clearly Autodesk has been in an uptrend. And when I look at the weekly chart, the last big move up here to open up March, uh, you can see the PPO coming up off of centerline support, moving higher. We're holding the rising 20 week moving average. When I pull this up on the longer term chart, I don't know, I'm not very interested in shorting the stock. Um, if I looked at it solely from a daily perspective and I said, okay, I have to short this stock, where would I short it? I would be looking at price resistance and I would probably go up here. You can see we had some selling, we bounced back up and then volume here picked up pretty substantially on the selling from about 135. Notice on the recent high, we went right up to 135. So if we had seen this before and we were looking to short back in the third, fourth week of April, you could get into a short position near 135 and simply cover your position if it goes to 136 on a close or intraday if you want to really uh, keep it tight. You could just say if it goes over 136 intraday, I'm out covering my position. Um, but what I'm looking for is for the stock to move back down to the prior low. Well, this is setting up a really strong reward to risk from a shorting perspective. You're at resistance, at least the resistance that you're picking out and you're setting a stop to say, if it goes back through say 136 or so, I'm getting out. My target's gonna be the prior low, which it hits about five or six days later. So what happens in this case, you sell short at 135 and you buy back those shares at 122. You make $13 on the trade. Your entry was at 122. So you're making $13 on $122 stock, a little bit better than 10% in six days. Not bad action. Now, as it's moving up again, and, I'm, and I am not advocating shorting any of these stocks, by the way, I'm not a fan of shorting in a bull market. I still think we're in a, in a bull market. But for those interested, I would just say manage your risk similar to how you would manage your risk on a long trade. So you're looking at resistance as where you might want to sell short. So if I was looking at a long, you know, being long, I'm looking at this support level to buy, and then I'm going to sell when it gets up to resistance. From a short perspective, you're looking at the opposite. You're going to short, you're going to initiate the transaction by selling short when it hits resistance, and then you're going to buy those borrowed shares back when it uh, hits your support. And then the broker is going to take care of all this stuff for you. It's not like you know, you have to go find whoever you borrowed the shares from, like the example I, I went over earlier with the car in the neighbor's uh, driveway. You don't have to do any of that. All of that's accounted for by the market, by the brokers. Um, you're simply selling first, buying back later. Again, the risk, what if news comes out? Let's say you're short at 135. It's no different really than being long, except that on the short side, you have unlimited risk to the upside. But let's say uh, Autodesk, you hit resistance, you're like, this is it. This is a great spot to get in on the short side. I'm getting in, selling short at 135. Next morning, you wake up and Autodesk has been bought out by a company that's trading at 175 next morning. Well, uh, you can't get out at 135, even though your stop is at 136. Sorry, but the stock is now trading at 175. So now you're buying at 175. You sold at 135. You just took a $40 loss on the stock. So it's no different than anything else. If you're holding overnight news, anything can happen. Um, just remember that to the downside, you're protected by the amount that you're investing. To the upside, there is no such protection. And in fact, if the losses are great enough, you may be getting a call from your broker saying, okay, 
you don't have enough in your account based on margin requirements, you are going to be forced to sell. You're going to have to sell this or you're going to have to deposit more funds in your account. It can get really, really um, disheartening, very risky. Uh, so just understand what you're doing if you're shorting. All right, so that was Autodesk. Let's take a look at a couple of other stocks here and then we'll wrap up. Uh, let's go to the next one, Align Technology. I know longer term, this has been a pretty good one, but short term, we did have the gap down after earnings, been sideways consolidating here for a while. So very similar to what we were just looking at on Autodesk. Let's say, you know, we were looking to short, we had this big gap down, went down for five days, and then all of a sudden we get this big recovery and, all, and we're at gap resistance. And this is the level where we deem that, hey, if it goes through here, I'm going to get stopped out. Uh, but I'm going to short it at 265 or 266, and I'm going to ride it back down to gap support or to prior price support, whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, hopefully, you get out, you buy back at that lower price, and it comes back up again. Maybe you can short it again. But literally, what I do when I'm shorting, it's almost like I turn my, my computer monitor upside down. So instead of waiting for pullbacks to support, to buy, and then waiting for a move back up to some resistance level to sell, it's the exact opposite. You're selling first when you're getting close to a resistance level, and then you're buying back at whatever predetermined target that you're looking for, maybe in terms of price support, gap support, trend line support, moving average support, whatever it is that you're looking at. Uh, let me do one more, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Uh, we'll just uh, let's actually microchip came out with earnings this morning. Let's see uh, what we got here. OK, it's up. Um, but this is another one. Maybe you're looking at microchip. And you said, well, you know, the semiconductors have been struggling a little bit of late, getting a little bit of a move to the upside here. We got reaction high off of this selling it came, comes back up here just above 90. We get up there earlier today. The 50 day moving average is sitting there. Um, this is an area that I want to short. So again, you're going to keep a fairly tight stop, um, sell short at uh, the 90, 91 area. And then you're looking maybe to profit from a move back down to 82. If it goes back down to 82, you're going to cover there. That's where you're going to buy. So you will have bought at 82. You will have sold at 90. You'd have made $8 on that trade or roughly 10%. So essentially what you're doing with shorting is you're, you're just – um, profiting from stocks going down as opposed to profiting from them going up. And so with that, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we can maybe take a look at the final summary slide again, things that we covered. And then also I'd like to pull that uh, poll up one more time and uh, take a look at that. Well, there's the poll and uh, it's still fairly similar to what we looked at before. I think another 70 people or so have responded. Um, but still about half of you have never shorted a stock. It's prob I mean, I think for the most part, that's probably best because there are risks involved. I know if you've talked to somebody who's shorted, I'm sure they have stories of how they've made a lot of money shorting. But there's a, there is risk. There's a lot more risk in shorting than there is in being long. And you have to be aware of those risks. Um, you have to be aware of a lot of things. you got to do your homework. I think that example I gave you earlier where – an investor tried to short $37,000 worth of a uh, pharma. And next day, essentially, it was revealed that another pharma, the CEO, was accumulating shares and gaining control. And the stock went up 800%. And you're, there you are sitting there with a short position. Um, can be extremely risky. You want to make sure that you understand those risks before investing. Miss the live show? Want to rewatch a workshop? Tune into the Stock Charts TV YouTube channel to catch up on the latest programming and content. All of our live shows, workshops, special guests, and more can be found there. Each category has its own playlist, so it's easy to locate. We even have Chart School and creative strategy videos to help you become a better technical trader. Leave comments for our commentators, like your favorite videos, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.